Uh, let me begin. It's about restoring U.S. prosperity and some comments on Brazil. Um, prosperity and depression are relative concepts. U.S. is 3,000% more prosperous now than in 1800. U.S. is 400% more prosperous than Brazil now, using the standard sets of PPP numbers. U.S. is 40% more prosperous than Western Europe and Japan. Uh, U.S. is currently depressed relative to its pre-2008 trend. Half due to productivity being below trend, half due to market hours per adult being below trend. Uh, and this depression has lasted 4.5 years. Uh, how much longer? I hope not much. We all know about modern economic growth. Basically, the trend growth is about 1.8% a year, which means doubling every 39 years. Um, and when I do detrended, we'll use this 1.8% detrending, annual detrending. Well, my position is that economic, aggregate economics has become a hard sentence, science. There's deviations from theory. There's a great interaction between theory and measurement. Um, it really started off with the aggregate production function, SOLO, who cites Haltacker for the underlying aggregation theory. Uh, though McKenzie also deserves credit there. And you can trace back to earlier people that had the basic ideas to uh, Marshall, for example. <clears throat> Marshall, for example. But they didn't develop it formally. Aggregate households that value leisure. Put that aggregate household, then it became a neoclassical. People were substituting. People were allocating time between market and non-market activity in the model economies we use. People were just making decisions on how to allocate their income between savings or investment and consumption. This theory came out of the national accounts and the growth facts. It interacts beautifully with that. And by the way, it also, when your macro models you use to address a question, you're constrained by micro observations. Uh, there's no such thing as macroeconomics anymore. There's just economics, again. Now, what do I mean by theory? Well, I follow Lucas. Theory is a set of instructions for constructing a model economy to answer a given question. What's a good model for that question? <laughs> well, depends upon what the theory is and what the uh, available measurement. I see neoclassical growth theory like Newton's theory of the solar system and Dalton's atomic theory as being a theory in this sense. Through the interaction between theory and measurement, science progresses. Measured deviation from theory lead to advancements in theory, and better theory leads to better measurement. It spirals back and forth. Now, you're using theory to address a question. What do you do? Select a model economy. And in this theoretical framework, you've got to specify the initial capital stocks, maybe some other things. Compute the equilibrium path given the aggregate production function residuals and given policies. We can only forecast if we know what policies will be. Um, and our ability to forecast future policies is limited. Um, by the way, we look at the perfect foresight because it's easy to compute and, and it gives essentially the same answer as if you would give the predicted path is essentially the same as if you give the people the right expectation scheme when you generate artificial data from your model economy. It had a lot of successors. I'm, I'm going to make the case that this is the uh, golden age of uh, aggregate economics. We've made so much progress. We're making so much progress. And there's so much 
important pro progress to be made. So fortunately, we're not out of business. Um, well, fortunately for economists. For example, we Finn Kittle and I found that productivity shocks were an important contributor to business cycles in the U.S. in this 1954-1980 period in our time to build paper. There's lots of other findings. That non-neutrality of technology change, the model was robust to that. Greenwood, Herquis, and Huffman have a, effectively show that. Then some people put transaction demand into the model. Cooley and Hansen. This is basic and found that it was a small effect. Virtually no effect on the real, but big effect on the price level. And interest, nominal interest rates. In the 90s, Japan lost a decade of growth. Why? Europe and the US during this period did extremely well. What's different about Japan? Why didn't they do extremely well? Um, so Fumio Ayashi and I looked at that using this, the, theor the theory of uh, growth theory. And we found the problem was not financial, as many people thought. As soon as Japan shifted to a pro-productivity growth policy, output and stopped subsidizing inefficiencies through the regulatory, bureaucratic banking system uh, and their zombie banks, output per working age person again grew. That's slightly more than trend. Um, Japan's not doing that badly if you look at output per working age person, but that population's shrinking in Japan, given their demographics. They seem to work great up until 1990, that simple one-sector growth model. But then in the 90s, there's this huge deviation from the predictions of theory and observations. Aggregate TFP and GDP hours were low relative to trend. Hours worked was super high. Uh, if anything, labor taxes were rising, not falling, so it was not a change in the tax regime. But the predictions of theory is there's a depressed economy. The blue line, what happened? This is per capita output. The red line. Yes, thank you. Um, there were other deviations. Normally in boom, corporate profits are big, share. But there were low accounting profits in the big boom in the uh, 90s. There was low GDP per hour in the boom. GDP is measured output. It's not output. There's a lot of unmeasured output. Um, was, it the, was it a case of animal spirits? People became workaholics? No. <laughs> um, within general equilibrium, you can get anything if you're free on uh, the shocks, but uh, to preferences in technology. What was the resolution of the puzzle? The addition of intangible capital, know-how organizational capital, patents, trained workforce, setting up good accounting systems for your organization, clientels, etc. These investments are big. Everybody agreed with that. The only reason people did not bring that in was they didn't have a good way to do it. Um, the problem is how to incorporate intangible investment and stock in a disciplined way. McGratton and I use the equilibrium condition that businesses equate after-tax returns on investments in measured and unmeasured investment for their owners. It's key that accounting profits are not the same as economic profits. If you're making big investments in intangible capital, 
they get expensed. They reduce your accounting profits. But you're producing something and your economic profits are a lot bigger. These unmeasured investments show up later in uh, capital gains. But I'm not in bad company. We're not in bad company here. Albert Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. So we're, we're hard. Our physics is a hard science like uh, macroeconomics is now. The theory with the intangible capital, everything fit like a glove, including things we was not. Uh, didn't even enter into the selection of uh, the model. In particular, these accrued capital gains that show up in the flow of funds, or the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, mostly on the balance sheets that they report in that doc document. The model, by the way, that we use for the booms is this identical one that we use to look at the current U.S. depression. There is a difference. In the late 90s, technology change was strongly biased toward the production of intangible capital. There was a high-tech boom. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that output was much higher than reported. The MBA students were dropping out to start new businesses. And you've got to make big investments to start a new business. Um, in the 2007 to 2012 period, it was neutral with regard to measured output, GDP, and this unmeasured, which is over 10% of GDP. GDP. The, the model says the primary reason for the current US depression is below trend productivity growth. Other factors are of some importance, needless to say. Policy uncertainty, increase in tax rates and hidden subsidies, and overbuilding of residential housing. Uh, the financial crisis was a small, was just a, a symptom, not a cause of the problem. I say U.S. has been doing badly. I just used this 1.8% trend and looked at a predicted and actual GDP per adult. The unmeasured investment is also depressed, so the depression is even greater. There's no recovery. It came down about 10% uh, and now it's about 13% below. Um, there was another puzzle that uh, Prente and I ran into when we looked at, among other things, in our barriers to riches, Japanese growth miracle. We found that the standard theory is not consistent with that, unless there was more capital, but not too much more. In this intangible capital that we found, 1.7 GMPs of it, is just the right amount. So, puzzle resolved. Notice everything is unified. It's the same theory for all these. There's, no, there's not one theory for this set of observation, another theory for that set. It's common. It's a, it, the theory also has big implications for financial asset markets. Originally, McGratton and I started there and of course, you can look at the value of corporations, and a lot of corporations have a lot higher value than the value of their uh, capitalized assets. Um, the total value, debt and equity, depends upon some price that depends upon policy pi times the stock of tangible capital, which is capitalized, plus QT, Q intangible, times the price of intangible. Things depend upon current variables. Uh, there's other equilibrium relations, but this one is useful. It depends upon current things. The present value of dividends, they don't, the Wall Street Journal doesn't report what future dividends will be. Uh, the arrow to brew tree and, <laughs> but here you go with the current statistics to come up with a current level. Um, by the way, this GMP equity value has varied a lot. 1929 is 1.67. It's about half that in 1962. And 
almost that big in 2000. The predicted, and actually in two, March of 2000, was slightly bigger, or 15% bigger. Now the predicted values out of this simple theory, you have to build in the features of the tax system. There's a big differences on taxes on corporate income and taxes on distributions. Um, in the corporate sector that pays, that is subject to the corporate income tax, it produces half the value added in the U.S. Unincorporated businesses and pro uh, proprietorships, partnerships, get another quarter. Home businesses that rent houses to the household that owns them is another eighth, and government production is another eighth. Um, so here's predicted and actual. Uh, pretty close. These are the tax rates. That's what mattered. This is on distributions to owners. It was quite low in, 20, in that period in 1929 and, and had been for five years. It was quite high in 1962 and had been for five years. It had come way down in 2000 and had been for five years. What was the reason for that big decline? Deferred compensation schemes where people save to further compensation and payment of taxes to later when they're retired and use that money to finance their retirement consumption. Corporate profit taxes were also important. And they're pretty high in the US. It's, if you look at after-tax profits divided by GMP, that varies little. The reason for the big variation is variation in tax rates and institutional constraints. In the 60s, corporations could not buy back shares unless they had a very specific objective and acquisition. They could, people that ran pension funds could not, in fiduciary roles, could not buy stocks. They're personally liable if the stock market went down. That changed about 1980. But that intangible capital was crucial. And there's another puzzle that, the equity premium puzzle. McGrath and I found about a third of that was the, uh, due to taxes. We looked at after-tax returns. That's what I care about, the after-tax return. Uh, and, and I think that's what Mert Miller cared about. I guess I'm following him. Intermedia intermediation costs are big. You look at the national accounts and you see these big items. And that's about another third of the 6% difference between <clears throat> return on the stock market, average, and the return on um, short-term government debt. The re remaining one-third, I think, is related to liquidity value of short-term government debt. The excess volatility puzzle of Leroy Porter and Schiller has been strengthened by examining this alternative equilibrium relation. I hope one of you Brazilians uh, resolve that puzzle and do it pretty soon because then I will celebrate. What about the great US depression of the 30s? Well, Cole and O'Haney made that huge advance by introducing cartels in a formal way, quantitative way. Um, and that gives rise to insiders and outsiders. Italy and Spain have that problem now. And I expect there's a little bit of that problem in Brazil. I know there's a little bit in the US. Um, by the way, the cartelization policy accounted for much of the failure of the US economy to recover in the 1934-39 period. Throughout that decade, the US economy was depressed about over 20 to 25 percent relative to this is output per working age person, or GDP per working age person. The statistics are not the greatest in that period. Um, it's turned out that they, Hoover increased tax rates a lot, and Roosevelt a little more. Um, and that was also a contributing factor. Our understanding of the Great Depression, using the same theoretical framework, 
um, has advanced significantly, but much more remains to be done. Um, there are many studies of other Great Depressions. Brazil had one in the 20th century between about 1980 and 1995. Um, Keo and I brought together a bunch of studies, all using this common theoretical framework, the one sector model, um, to look at Great Depressions in various countries. Um, Fisher and Hornstein paper, I was particularly impressed. It said why the Germans had that depression greater than the US or decline in the 1928 to 32 period. It was wage policies. They set the wage rate too high in Anyone interested in the, the Brazilian Depression in the 1980s and 1990s should study this paper in that volume by Bulgarin, Ellery, Gomes, and Tessaria. Um, they're the experts on Brazil. But an important development is we moved to, from the dynasty structure to the overlapping generation. Um, it turns out that you look at bequests and things, the, Single people give the same amount, percentages, people with kids. Um, and it, but there was, Joins, Braun, and Nikita looked at Japan, and they predicted a falling savings rate before it started happening, if the OLG framework was the, the right one. Before then, both seemed to work roughly equally well. Dynasty of uh, Barrow the utility of the children come into the utility of the parents in a special way. And then there's a bunch of micro studies using panel data um, that said OLG. And by the way, there's also a key technology development was the increase in computer power. In the study I'll mention very result very briefly, we had to go to this to the supercomputers. Over 2,000 parallel computers, the computer system they used to land that, the Land Rover on Mars. Uh, Elmer Grattan's husband is a rocket scientist and had access to that computer power. Um, what should USA do to restore prosperity? I use USA rather than, and I use USB, United States of Brazil, or USM, United States of Mexico. Um, return to pro-productivity growth policies. And I say get rid of all capital income taxes. What would happen? Well, the green path is if we stayed on the old policy regime. There was a change about 19, in 19, 2007. It was indicated by a shift in public opinion to the a more redistributional, preserve the status quo policy. Under current, unless we shift, the current one is the blue one at the bottom. The proposed one is it would be growth. And that's a big difference, a third, about over a third higher consumption. Uh, these are. The people that benefit a lot, all gen by the way, associated with this shift in regime, all birth year cohorts currently alive and future co cohorts are better off. How much government debt would you need? I thought you'd need a lot. It turned out you only needed a little bit. Um, numbers in, we, in the magnitude of what we see. Big increase in household sector network occurs. Some is due to a larger capital output ratio. But the big part is this Q, the value over the stock at reproduction cost. Um, that number is about 0.6 now. With this change, it would go up to nearly one. There would be a lot more savings opportunities. The big problem in Europe is the lack of people who need a place to save for retirement. They're desperate for places. You go in Asia. Who do you see? All these Germans. Please, I want to find a place to save some, to invest. But everybody cannot invest abroad. If somebody invest, 
lend, somebody else has to borrow because it's zero net supply. Um, we phased in the new policy, that's why it took so long. Um, the real re after tax returns stay at the nearly 4%, which has characterized the US return on capital, average after taxes, since the national income accounts were first reported beginning in 1929. Key was shifting to mandatory saving for retirement and annuitizing of the mandatory savings when retired. That's the Australian system. Even the Swedes are catching on, and that's why I think Sweden has been doing a bit better than uh, in other parts of Europe, and a lot better than Southern Europe. By the way, our tax, our income tax system, uh, it's a relatively minor change could make that a consumption tax. All you have to do is say, let people, you want taxable income to equal to what people consume now, then it's a consumption tax equivalent. Um, everybody, all students of public finance agree that income taxes are, capital income taxes are bad. They make future cups of coffee more expensive in terms of current cups of coffee. Um, distorts the ability of the economy to transform relative to the ability of people to willingness to substitute between now and in the future. By the way, there's a lot more capital out there than people realize. The current, well, there's, the current level, it should be 5.7 GMPs. We include land, which developers create new communities, and those lots get a big value. Um, the IRS calls it land because it doesn't depreciate. Um, pure land in the U.S. and Brazil, price is about zero. Um, it's improved like land that's valuable. It would increase this. By the way, we use actuarial tables and the life expectancies and all that. And for each age, we had a an aggregate household, household for each birth year cohort. And actuarial tables were used. How has Brazil been doing? This is Brazil. Let's look at Brazil from 1950 to 2003 relative to the US productivity trend of, actually it's closer to 1.8%. Brazil went from 12% of the US trend to 26% in that 1950 to 1980 period, which is quite rapid. Did, does it continue? You know the answer, no, unfortunately. Um, they lost much of that, down to 18%. How has Brazil been doing recently? Relative, this is GDP relative to the US. At the end, you see a big uptick. Why? You better take a closer look. Has Brazil been doing extremely well or has the U.S. been doing poorly? The U.S. has been doing poorly. We're going to do better. <laughs> uh, I believe in my people, of my country. Um, GDP per capita relative to U.S. trend. They haven't, Brazil hasn't been doing so well since 2000. The growth rates of fallen, actually last year was below trend. Um, what are the problems? Last night I heard that they increased spending. To spend is to tax, and to tax is to depress. And they started doing these um, industrial policies. <clears throat> Leave it to the corporations, like Vitbail, <clears throat> and other groups. There's a lot of high-tech operations in Brazil. But, Brazil's a little bit worried about the Chinese. <laughs> Chinese were dirt poor uh, in 1978, about 4% of the US. That's back when Brazil was up about 28%. But now, Japan, has, GDP-wise per capita, 
China has overtaken Brazil. Um, and they have not done that at the expense of Brazil. Brazil needs better policies. What should Brazil do? Decentralize, more state rights for the Brazilian states. Let the state's governments compete to better serve the Brazilian people. Cut tax rates, have more great multinationals like Vale Valley. Set up better system to finance retirement. Follow Australia. Um, another thing I had mentioned that don't try to spend your way to prosperity. It just leads to increases taxes and depresses the economy. Create a good an environment where it's easy to start up businesses, where firms can, if they're successful, can expand rapidly. If they're unsuccessful, they go bankrupt um, or just stay the same size. So that completes what I have to say. Uh, the one area we got to get better language is how to handle, how to, we know what are good institutions, but how to set it up and sustain it. Um, and that's going to have to go beyond the theory of value for that purpose. A couple of the people at this foundation are working on this problem. I learned about that last night. And they're doing f so much information for thought. Uh, when I had dinner with them last night, Cavalcante and uh, Arujo were the two people. Um, so you, I'm sure there's a lot of other good theorists in um, Brazil as well. But get that better language and we'll copy it and benefit America. Oh, British America, English speaking America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Prescott, for sharing your views with us and for such a brilliant and excellent exposure, dealing with several different ways to analyze the American economy and the Brazilian economy as well. So fortunately, we do have time for questions and answers. I will open the word for the floor. And I'd like to ask everybody who wants to ask something to please identify himself uh, because this session is being recorded. And I'll take two questions at a time so that we have more room for questions. Please. Hi, Dr. Prescott. My, my name is Ronaldo Parente. I'm a professor at Florida International University and a visiting professor here at FGV. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I probably understood one third or less of what you've been talking. But, uh, one thing that puzzles me, uh, on your proposal, you seem to um, incentive to cutting tax and putting more income, disposable income in the hands of the people to spend more. So that's what I understood when you cut taxes, more people have more money, so more disposable income. How would that account for inflation? Uh, because if people start spending money suddenly in the US, it seems to be a, to be a problem with inflation. And the other thing is, um, it seems to be a reduction of the middle class in the United States. I, I've been living there for 20 years, and I've been noticing that it's less and less middle class, and money is being more into the rich and more poor people. You see more and more on that, it's at least in the big cities. Um, wouldn't that problem be how you control for not having a bad, bad, uh, it's, it's good that everybody spend more money, but how would be if the money is on the hands of the rich people, they would save their money and keep and more poor people, less middle class? Would your model account for that? Thank you very much. Another question, please. Just one question per person, and then we have the answer. Please. Haroldo Vilhena uh, from Casa do Conhecimento. Uh, if you look like a uh, if you get US, if you get, uh, for example, Japan and China, okay? Uh, what I have, I, I'm, I'm not an economist also, and uh, if I look at US, looks like 10% of the GDP would be 
from industries. And at that time, at least in, 80, in 2008, 75% uh, would be consumption. That, that has to do with what he, he's talking about. Um, if you go, go to China, uh, it's the big producer, uh, uh, producer from, from the world, industrial producer. Can you really uh, compare these kind of GGPs that comes from really different, uh, uh, you know, uh, fountains, or you know, Thank you. come from different areas? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The key variable in determining standard of living is productivity. And we need better theories of that. That's, let's make it output per hour. There's, there's some variation in the hours worked across countries. But Brazil hours are, appear to be quite high at the uh, level of the most of the uh, industrial countries. So, that's, so it's a productivity number. There's no shortage of wants. You know, when you get richer, you can figure out how to spend the money very quickly. Um, you try to imagine what you're going to do when, before you get richer. It's hard. But uh, once you get richer, it's easy. The, basically, there's no shortage of wants. What determines things are the, in this theoretical framework is productivity. There is a, how much people work. Europe is, 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 has very high marginal tax rates, and as a result is depressed about 40 percent, well, depressed 30 percent relative to the U.S. Um, but they're the exception, Japan, New Zealand, uh, Australia, U.S., Brazil, Chile, Mexico. Actually, Mexico works a little bit more. Uh, so the, you can have, if you're in a community, you've got to increase the output. Income is just claims against output. Income equals output. There's always a residual claimant. Um, it's not spending more, having the government spend, purchase more goods and services or give it to people to purchase more goods and services. Um, there's something hidden there. You've got to pay that in the form of taxes later. It, Stimulus is not a word in the uh, economic language of the modern one. It is in the, when I started out, I was a, worked in the Keynesian macroeconometric tradition, the ISLM cross, Larry Klein was explicit modeling in, in a discipline approach. You know, we forecast, uh, Lucas forecast that, if they tried to exploit the Phillips curve, it would go away. They tried to exploit the, mm -hmm. Phillips curve in the 70s, it went poof, disappeared. Rather than having 4% unemployment and 4% inflation, there was 9% inflation and 9% unemployment. Um, so that was a success of this dynamic general equilibrium thinking. He truly did not use the explicit um, neoclassical growth theory. Um, but he did use that in theory of supply and some of its in the mechanics of development uh, later. So it, it's best not to think about, there's just no sh shortage of, uh, well, su says law, supply equals demand. I mean, supply creates its own demand. And we've got to increase the quantity of the size of the pie that we have and then everybody gets better off. Some people talked about the, uh, the insiders doing great and the outsiders doing badly. There goes the middle class. It's been happening in the US. When it happened in the late 30s with the policies that created the insiders who did great in the Great Depression. But there's awful s small number of them, those lucky people, the ins insiders. So now we, they got a model with insiders and outsiders. Everybody thought it was important, uh, insider, outsider, but now we have an explicit models and we can start matching it up to the data and 
and get quantitative in our theory. And I see that insider outsider is key in Italy and Spain and lesser extent uh, Portugal. Another question, please. So, Ed, um, here in Brazil, we have a long tradition of um, uh, central banking as an important institution, what it's doing, and inflation targeting. And there is no s s single reference to that in your talk. Would you uh, explain yeah, on that? The role of the central bank is to maintain a stable unit of account. The price of uh, goods in terms of reals, or the price of reals today in terms of reals tomorrow, that's the interest rate. Um, and getting that independence was key to the uh, recovery of Brazil. Brazil was, in the banking sector, the amount of resources allocated to that skyrocketed in that period of extremely rapid inflation. The Brazilians got incredibly good at clearing things fast. And that's wasted. They should be spending their time figuring out how to produce more output. Um, and there should be an independent central bank with that responsibility. And if they don't carry out that responsibility, they should be fired. If they do, they should be thanked. Um, they can't do a lot for the real side. Um, just shuffling on some balance sheets is not going to do that. Uh, I, I think the U.S. government is the QE1, QE2, QE3. Did the economy recover? No. They claimed if we hadn't done this, the economy would have gone way down. Um, and the people said that the economy would come roaring back if we spend more. They spent more, and it went down. Said, well, you had to spend even more. It would have gone down further. Um, <laughs> it's like those people that say the world's coming to an end and get their big following out there on the top of the hill. And it doesn't come to an end. And the psychologists tell you that what happens? People, most of the people wander away and sort of disassociate. But the hardcore stays there, and they say, because of our beliefs, we saved the world. It would have come to the end. Um, that's what I fear is the case. You can't expect the, you want good independent statistical agencies. U.S. is blessed with good ones. You want good independent central bank. And those people responsible for making the central bank independent, again, in Brazil, deserve a lot of credit. Another question. Hi, this is uh, Paulo Grau from JGP. Uh, since you, you comment on the central bank and your, your, your views that uh, what the central bank in the U.S. is doing right now has been sort of innocuous for, for the real economy, I'm wondering what would be your comments when the central bank has to stop the current uh, QE policies. I mean, will that be an innocuous or, uh, in your view, that would, that would raise the risk of uh, having a negative impact in the business cycle? This is a new thing. We, the central bank in the U.S. never did this before. Theory suggests that it's just sort of exchanging, shifting balance sheets, items, and keeping the net worths of all the units fixed. There could be a, the economy, the engineers may come through and have another tech boom that saved, uh, that made the 90s such a great period. It wasn't Greenspan spiraling. Uh, though he did follow good monetary policy and avoided inflation. Um, the, uh, and if the interest rate goes up, the, the Fed is borrowing short and lending long. And you generally tell banks not to do that because if the interest rates go up, they become insolvent. If 
the Fed became insolvent, would it go bankrupt? No, it can't. It can always uh, just give people dollar bills or, or $20 bills or $100 bills. Um, there is some risk that in these new things, it's something we hadn't thought about. Um, and I'd like to be pretty confident before going on these uh, adventuresome routes, but I don't think there'll be any problem of the adjustment should tell people and start phasing it in in a gradual way and think in terms of long-run policy. What are good sets of rules for the people in the economy to operate under? Um, that will, Having people buy houses with zero down, I do not think was good policy. Um, some people, particularly lower income, got into a lot of financial problems once the prices stopped going up. The people who got in early did well, but, but that's random redistributions. Um, and, and People are risk averse is the empirical evidence, so it's, it, it has some welfare consequences, these surprises. Another question. <laughs> Hi. I'm Luis, an undergraduate, undergraduate student from IBMEC. You said some time ago that you can spend your way into prosperity. Some, something we know Brazil is doing right now. But you also showed China, who is doing quite well, and also have a relative big government. How can you account for that? China is a lot more decentralized than you realize. They have a term limit of 10 years when the regimes change. There's 80 million Communist Party members that pick the next regime. Um, the regime's not worrying about getting reelected after the 10 years because that's the rules that got set up back in 78 uh, by some insightful person. Um, they have these special economic zones. And one of the rules there is don't ask, do. Shenzhen, you know, poor rural village in 1978. Now it's the, maybe the richest city in uh, China. All the buildings are gleaming new with 10 million people. Um, it was just a spectacular economic su success. There's competition between the various uh, areas. There's a lot of province rights. Um, the, what's going to happen in China is going to be fascinating. If they start, as long as they keep growing, it'll be easy to govern. People like and support rapid growth. At some time, they're going to ask asymptote out to a higher growth, balanced growth path. And that's when political problems could develop. And some bad policies get institute that try to preserve the status quo. And Japan got up to 85% of the U.S. in terms of productivity in the early 90s. Now it's down at 70%. Uh, th they started subsidizing inefficiency through their zombie banks, is, my, is the only theory I know about. Those areas that had the, fi they figured out different ways to get the financing. Banks became less important. Banks became much more like the U.S. Um, their banks were the venture capital funds, everything. Uh, they would own the stock and, but now there's, and firms figured out, small and big firms figured out how to get their financing. They sold some land which was very highly priced. Um, you look at that Emperor's Palace in Tokyo, that's worth more than the state of California, the land it's on. Uh, they have very high land values there. To carry out some of these analysis for Japan would be, where land is so valuable, pure land, is going to require an extension of the theory. 
Well, th since we passed from, from the U.S. to, to Asia, I, I think I'm going to change gears and go to Europe. So let me ask you one question that I think it's a, a generalized curiosity nowadays. So for us, for Brazilians putting their money in the stock market, it would be a very good news if uh, Angela Merkel had not said that she would never accept euro bonds as a way of mutualizing the non-payable debts or non-short-run payable debts from Europe. So having said that, uh, assuming that mutualization of, of European debt is not a possible uh, thing to be done because there's no political support in, in Germany, maybe in, in other high productivity countries, we are left with three alternatives. First one is muddling through, which sometimes may be a good alternative. Second one is having the rich countries leaving the euro. Since the debt is denominated in euro, these rich countries would leave for another currency and this, this would not change the real value of the euro denominated debt. So that, that would be good news for Italy and Spain and, and very other indebted countries. And there's a third alternative, which is the poor countries, the low productivity countries leave the euro. And in this case, what would happen is that they would have another currency and the real value of the euro denominated debt that they have would increase. So uh, how do we do? Uh, should we just muddling through or? I think that maybe we should, they could have euros in name, but not in fact. Each, there'll be a German euro, a Cyprus euro, uh, and they may not exchange a par. Um, the countries that stayed out of the euro, Denmark, S Sweden, uh, and I think the UK, the first two have done very well. Uh, the UK, not worse than the, uh, the eurozone. That's just inherently a that leads to the centralization. It's nice to be able to have the same unit of account, but if they, if some of those bright theorists at this foundation could figure out a way to set up it where we had a common unit of account throughout the world, where it wasn't used to subsidize and other things, and that would be great. It has to be in fixed supply, or, and how to handle that is a problem. For the time being, it seems to be the national currencies are, <coughs> the best. Uh, you look at uh, reserve currencies, the, the Deutsche Mark was a big one and then they formed the euro and then the euro replaced it with, with about 23 percent of uh, reserves. Uh, it's the um, Friedman f forecasted there would be this problem with the euro. It didn't occur quite as fast as he forecasted, but he wasn't a well-articulated theory. It was sort of a intuition, I think, um, about, well, he, he, was, he was in the very sticky wage camp <laughs> and thought there had to be flexibility of exchange rates. Another question? Many, many, uh, many people say that the uh, complementary currency over in Swiss uh, played a key role for as uh, a way of not getting to crisis. Okay, now we have like Bitcoin, and we have like uh, uh, Canada uh, creating a, a currency similar to Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think uh, it's uh, uh, the, the, the complementary currency, what's the, the role of this complementary currency in, as being uh, against crisis? Against what, I'm sorry? Crisis. crisis. Sometimes when there is a financial crisis, <laughs> typically there's some changes in the policy regime. These policy regime changes can be good, but can be bad. 
examples of good ones are Scandinavia when all the banks went bankrupt, became insolvent in the uh, early 90s. Cases of bad reforms were what <laughs> Japan did in the early 90s when they had their financial crisis. Chile and Mexico gives a nice comparison. They're very similar. They had a lot of debt denoted in U.S. dollars and the interest rate on U.S. dollars went way up. Um, they, the price of their primary export, petroleum in the case of Mexico, copper in the case of Chile. But Chile put good reforms in, Mexico didn't. Mexico lost a decade of, and a half of growth, much like Brazil. Though they seem to be doing better recently, uh, foreigners are investing there, they, they seem to be developing stronger political and economic institutions. Uh, they're getting broader-based private ownership. Um, you want people to have an equity position in their country. That leads to respecting property rights, and that makes it possible for groups to get together and set up business enterprises and expand it and uh, create so social surplus that gets spread out throughout the economy. Um, they figure out better ways to do things, more productive. But this product, if you know the productivity number, that's, you get virtually all the difference in living standards across country and across time. Um, this, um, and I don't think what the, cent it's time for Europe just to admit that. There's no reason for the Germans to bail out the uh, Greeks and effectively sell their, what's a good uh, German car, Audis or something, we have a couple, uh, <laughs> at half, pr effectively at half price to the Greeks uh, through this issuing debt and de partial default on this. And there is this one very interesting country, I see a poll here. Uh, what country didn't have uh, any recession? I think it was in 2008. The country that did not spend, they said they wanted to maintain their credit worthiness. Poland, they grew. The other OEC country that grew was uh, Australia um, in that period. All the others experienced contraction. Um, of course, Brazil could be an OECD country if they wanted to be, but they're above that. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Well, since there's no question, I, I, I think I'll play the devil's advocate here for just a second. And when we look at Germany just after the war, after the separation of the two Germanys, completely different paths of development. The same thing for South and North Korea. And if you go to cities as well, we have Nogales, Sonora, Nogales, Arizona, with completely different paths of development, capital accumulation, work hours, and so on. So lead, that leads us to the idea that this con these countries or cities, they have the same geography, they have the more or less the same culture, but they do not have the same institutions. And so my question is, uh, going back to that sentence for, from Albert Einstein that you have shown in your slide, you said not, not everything that counts can be counted. So would the institutional absence, the absence of institutional factors in, in, in these quantitative models with, the, with which we make our way of living and of understanding things, would be the case of something that counts but cannot be counted? You're right, and the institutions are so, in those two dramatic examples you mentioned, sh clearly establish that fact. The question is, I suspect East Germany would better, would now be better off if they had followed the uh, Poland path and became an independent Euro member, EU member. Uh, uh, right now they receive huge subsidies and from the West, uh, and they have the wage set ar artificially high. Um, 
you know, all the young people are moving to West Germany and getting good jobs and uh, progressing. But this is where we need better theory, better language to talk about these questions. I, I get very frustrated when I try and get f formal there because just the, the the language has not been developed. The people are thinking about it and are fighting with the problem. And in time, I suspect economics will be able to provide some guidance to how to set up better institutions, I hope. <laughs> and bet it will. Any more questions? Just one very short. Joel, about econometrics. question there in the audience. Uh, going back to the U.S., uh, if you increase, how do you deal with the high labor cost of employees in the U.S.? Uh, you know, it's been a, uh, U.S. has been a country that's been focused more on services and exporting service. And what happened in the U.S., today, anything to be produced in the U.S. would cost a lot more than anywhere else. How in, in this path of increasing productivity to make a better world, how how, how you deal with that? Thank you. Let's, let's see. The um, the U.S. is a high wage country because it's a high productivity on average. Um, now, when people start talking about industry industries, and you sort of dig deep into those issues that concept of industry is not as clean as it might be. You talk about the manufacturing industry, and you see this final goods and services stay roughly the same share of output, about 35%. Yet, value added in those establishments categorized as manufacturing establishment has fallen dramatically. Um, what's an establishment? In the U.S., it's a postal address where business activities take place. Uh, and if most of the workers are in manufacturing act task, then it's characterized as a manufacturing. There's a lot of things that used to be manufacturing firms. They took all the workers and had them become employees of a service industry which they lease back from the uh, service industry. And now, they're now that becomes a service. Uh, they, the people do the same thing, the same activities, but they now s categorize as service workers. It's a really dramatic example in agriculture. Um, in the US, corporations are coming out in, in uh, there's tax reasons and buying up land and leasing it back to the uh, farmers. There's some tax gains associated with this. <coughs> now, suddenly the land becomes, your sell, that company is selling, who bought up the land, is selling services, land services. Value added in the manufacturing, in the agricultural sector goes down. There's weird things that go on in this, uh, accounting system with its industry and should be dig deep into the numbers before you and be skeptic. And by the way, Brazil data statistics agencies, uh, there's room for improvement and that would be uh, good for Brazil. And they got to be independent. Not like Argentina. <laughs> okay, so uh, Professor Prescott, we are very much honored to have had you here today in this opening session and proud to continue the high tradition established by the Vali PGE conference, which I hope with the help of Jean Vitor Isler and our former alumnus and Professor Roberto Castelo Branco our first PhD, to continue uh, the next years with 
themes as relevant as this one. So I'd like to invite you all to a coffee break at the other side of the room. Thank you very much. Thank you.